All right. Hi, uh, I'm Jean-Luc from the user research team at Paradox Interactive. Um, I'm here to talk about tools, but before I do that, I want to give you guys a bit of context. Um, Paradox Interactive, we are a publisher and also a developer. We make strategy games, complex ones, um, management games, and also role-playing games. Right now, there's approximately 280 employees. Most of them uh, are at our Stockholm office in Sweden. We also have a, a bunch of other studios. One of them is in Umeå, another in Malmö, and a third one is in Delft, so Sweden and the Netherlands. Within those 280 employees, there is six of us who are the user research team. And two things that you need to know about us is that, or three things, is that we are a support function, which means that we try to help different parts of the company as much as we can, and as many parts of the company as we can. Uh, we are pretty young in the grand scheme of things. Two years ago, we did not exist. And a thing that is uh, a, a bit unique, <laughs> I, I'll get to it. Um, we are the result of a bottoms-up approach, which means that there was nobody at the very top who kind of felt like user research was a thing that we needed to, to have soon. Instead, it came from a bunch of people in, a, in QA. They thought that this was important and that Paradox should have this. So they took it upon themselves to make this happen. They began by just reading papers and books, training themselves. Then they moved on to uh, starting to conduct studies using employees as test participants, and they kept building on that. And after a while, it worked, attracted the, the company's attention, and um, the company decided to plug them out of QA and to create a proper user, user research team uh, with them. Along came a proper uh, user research lab. Um, so right now there are four researchers. There's one, uh, so they conduct the research, there's one administrator. She's the one in charge of finding and recruiting the right participants. And there's me, team lead, which kind of means producer, more or less. Um, I want to give you guys, uh, I want to tell you a few things about me. Um, I began the working in the games industry five years ago. Uh, first, I was a UX designer in a French MMO company. Then I moved on to Germany to work for a AAA studio. Again, as a UX designer, uh, with a tiny bit of user research added. Then I left Germany and came back to France to work for Ubisoft. And that time, that was as a full-time user researcher. Um, I did that for two years. Then I moved to Paradox, um, where I joined uh, as a user researcher. What I enjoy about this, this path that I got is that I got to be part of both development teams and also publishing teams. And those two sides, even though they want exactly the same thing, which is making great games, uh, don't always behave and communicate in the same way. They don't use, always use the same words. They don't always look for the same solutions to problems that are identified while we make a game. And I find this extra relevant for us because uh, it seems that every user research team is always ending up in the middle. Uh, I mean that sometimes we work with one side, then the other, and sometimes we work with both sides at the same time. Um, I, I care about tools because I'm somebody who is very, very sensitive to miscommunication. I, there's nothing worth, worse for me than looking at two people who try to understand each other, try to, to complete a task together, and kind of fail. And I <laughs> like it even less when it happens at the office. Uh, I tend to lose sleep over this word. The worst for me is to see two people who work on the same game team are two specialists, brilliant, efficient, but they are specialists in two different disciplines. And even though they have to work together to make the game, there's something in the way that they communicate that prevents them from truly working together. So, <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> Um, so this is where tools come in. Um, I hope that sometimes making a tool might be a way to take the information that the two specialists need and present it in a different light. Did I do something? No, okay, sorry. Um, my hope is that 
by using a tool to present things differently, those two specialists could find a way to agree on what we're doing and also agree on what we have to do next and look in the same direction together. I will now talk about the first tool that I want to present, and that one is about the study results. So um, I'm talking about each time that my team conducts a study, and I'm talking about the moment when the last participant leaves our lab. And the next step for us, right after this happens, is to find a way for every moderator that took part in this study to gather all of their notes together and to somehow all find what happened, what, what are the main results of that study. So it starts with a sheet. Um, this is a Google sheet because that's what uh, Paradox is using for most of its documentation. Could be done exactly the same way um, with Excel or something else. You guys don't have to look at the details too much. The one thing I want you to take away from our approach is that one row is uh, one issue or one interesting tidbit. It could be an observation, it can be uh, a reported opinion, it can be a weird thing that happened. And, but the, the core of the structure is like one item is one row. Then after that, we use columns just to add more and more uh, information about each of those issues. Right now, what's highlighted is which participants were impacted by an issue, or which um, participants reported a specific type of opinion. And what we do is that we force uh, everybody in the team to go digital. Even if you were using you know, a sheet of paper and a pen to note things while you were moderating and talking with people in the lab, when it comes time to put everything together and to get to a report, we, we say to people it has to go in there or it, it will never show up in our, in our report. And to make this less uh, intimidating, we give people the instruction that if you kind of know something, like, oh, this problem that I see written on like row 12, I, f I saw something, but I don't remember exactly when it happened to this participant, then just write an X, and we'll go back to it later if we have time. On the other hand, if you know exactly what's going on and you have very precise information, go to town, go, uh, go into that cell and add as much information as you can. Um, as you, as you could see from the different slides, we kept changing things. We went from this to that. And that was good and useful. We made tiny improvements that made it faster for people to input data, to retrieve data from that thing. And for a while, it worked. But the good thing is that Paradox was growing, keeps growing, and so we kept working with more and more teams. And there was a moment where we had too many people waiting to work with us, and it started to feel like we were messing up because we felt either too slow or we felt weird when somebody was coming to us mid-writing the report and was asking, so what's up? And we were all typing away frantically at our keyboards and going like, just wait, just wait one day and I'll, then I will be able to tell you what's up with the study. And it felt not great, because suddenly the person that we, we call the user research lead, which is the researcher who is in charge of one report or, and of one project, um, felt pretty confused. Things were unclear to him because he could look, or she, he or she could look at the team writing the report, all working data diligently, but it was extremely tough for him to predict how fast we were going and when would the report be finished. Another problem on top of that, that also felt not great, was that while we're working on one report for, let's say, the strategy game, because it's a company and things keep moving all the time, sometimes the management game shows up and asks, hey, I know, there was, no, there was no heads up, but we need one of you guys now. And unfortunately, with this way of working, the only thing we could say was like, who could meeting next week? Thank you. I, I, yeah, I get you, but I can't help right now. And again, we're a central team. We think that as much as possible, we should help you know, as many parts of the company as we can. So that didn't really feel like we were a support group anymore. So that's what, <laughs> that's what we were for a while. 
<laughs> and what helped is a simple thing. Uh, you guys could open up Excel and do it in 20 seconds, is to make sure that everybody who works in this common document uh, shows what they're working on and what is the state of what they're working on. So every moderator, everybody who was involved, was uh, to indicate who's working on this one row in the sheet and um, is to indicate, is it done, yes, no. And those very, very simple things kind of removed those two awful feelings fast. It took only a couple of weeks until I got to see researchers who faced with the same initial problem. I only have two days to, to ship a report. Also, I know that the management game is waiting for me. Was suddenly th those people were able to look at their team after maybe like five hours of work and already go to them and say like, yeah, okay, now that I look at the sheet and at our progress, good job you guys, by the way, we still have to cut a third of the report. And even though we all felt bad about dropping data, the vibe was very different in, in our little part of the office. It felt like a smart decision, a smart discussion about what gets cut, and after the cut was done, it felt way less stressful to get to the finish line of the report. Um, on top of that, if we go back to the situation where the other project shows up while you are busy, and sometimes because of the way things are, it might be the more important project who shows up. It was also way easier for the whole team to look at, again, just this sheet, scroll a little bit, and start to have a, an intelligent discussion. We could go like, so we're 60% done, maybe those guys could still take those 60% and you know, improve the game based on that. Yes, we all feel confident that we can pluck a researcher away from this report work. And yeah, you get that uh, researcher to go to your fancy meeting. And yeah, that was very good. Um, next time you are thinking about either building a tool or buying it from a, you know, an agency, try to think or talk about what happens when the work is not done. Um, if somebody shows you like a very clean you know, output of a tool, something very precise and very pretty, try to ask them what it works, in, how it looks in draft mode. Um, because that will decide if you get to help the second team or not. Um, and then, or again, a simple thing, show progress. It's a very simple thing, but the impact is, is profound. Um, sometimes now the team is big enough that we have different reports going on at the same time, different works in different games. And it still takes me only 15 seconds to open two documents, scroll through them, and kind of get it. Even if I've not touched any of those games, I can see from those two documents that, okay, those guys are doing well, <laughs> those guys are, are under a lot of pressure, they should get a couple of days off next week. And again, yeah, showing progress is very good. An extra thing that we like about this sheet is that um, its structure is clear enough that everybody gets what's going on. To give you guys context, I think that the most complex function in that sheet is a sum, which means that anybody from our field gets what's going on with that tool. Anybody who's not from our field can also get it, I think. And because of that, you end up with um, a researcher who try to mess with it. So you guys don't have to understand the details. It's just a video that I'm going to let run for a while. What, what it is, is something, a script, written in Python by uh, one of our researchers, Henrik, and it's a, a script that um, scrapes some data from the sheet that I've shown you. And its goal is to take um, the detailed notes that the different moderators left, and to use those notes to find timestamps of interesting moments, and then uh, when the tool is done, it gives you like a bunch of uh, nice 15 to 30 seconds video clips of the most important moments of your, your entire session. And that thing was, again, only available because everybody understands what the tool is about, where at some of my other jobs, the tools that we were using were black boxes. And when you remove the black box, when anybody who is curious enough to kind of dig, look at the source code of what's going on, uh, will just give you good surprises and help your team in ways that you have never planned for. 
Um, an extra thing that Henrik told me about his work, his doing this tool, is that it helped him understand the devs better. When suddenly you, you're spending time coding, you are less likely to make inaccurate predictions about how much time it takes for your devs to change a thing in the game, um, which will probably lead them to enjoy more working with you. A, a tiny extra thing that is nice is that, again, if we go back at this, there's a publishing group and then there's a development group. Um, those guys are not used to see anybody from your group from publishing with a code editor opened up. So they just walked by, didn't say anything for weeks. But then when there was a social event and they couldn't help themselves but ask, hey, you had a code editor open, what's up? Which was suddenly a good way to start talking with a new dev team that we had not worked with before and go like, oh yeah, let me tell you about this. And also, hey, here's user research. You, you guys and us, we should talk. Um, an extra thing, and that comes from more the, the, the team lead perspective on what happened, <coughs> is that we chose to do this in-house. We could have chose, again, to find a vendor and to get a tool, uh, you know, just to buy the thing. But if you do it in-house, the extra thing you get is that um, your researchers can feel ownership about something. Um, I, I, I get that you can feel ownership as a researcher on the game that you work on, but I do also feel that it's a different kind. Uh, I think it's different that, let's say, the main uh, engine programmer who worked on it, because you didn't spend every day in the same part of the office as those guys. So when the game shifts, you do feel some kind of ownership, but there's also some distance when you're the researcher. So suddenly getting to you know, code your own tool, um, makes you feel like, okay, this one task, it's me, I made it, it has my name on it, I, I s will now see it run on many computers by, when my colleagues are working, and I get to feel good about this. <coughs> on top of that, um, Henrik didn't say that, but I think that it's also nice for, you, for a researcher to sometimes get a task you know, started and completed by yourself. Most studies, at least with the way we run things, there's a, but we're always a team which is great, shared accomplishments feel pretty good, but there is something to kind of moving away from this a little bit and spend like five, ten, you know, man days working on your own thing by yourself. So things we learned, avoid black boxes as much as you can. Um, right now, if I were to buy a tool from some vendor, I would have this discussion. I would try to get them to tell me if I can see the source code or not. Um, in-house tools are motivating, so next time you have to decide between buying something outside or making it inside, think about what's going on with your team right now, how motivated are, are them, do they need a win, maybe? Because that's the way to give them. And that's not what, anyway, that's me. <laughs> uh, that's, that's my tiny thing. If we think back about the video that I've just shown you, this was a common line tool. And I think that for our purposes, uh, graphical user interfaces, maybe we just don't need them. Maybe this extra time is just wasted. Um, again, uh, we're adults. Even though it looks awful and does not feel intuitive, your colleague can teach you to use a comment tool, and then you'll be set. We rarely, it rarely takes more than one day for a new person who joins the team to get this thing running. Um, speaking of motivation, um, this tool, the second one that I want to show you today, um, I care about it because I made it, and that was motivating for me. Um, and this one, it's about gamepad controls, because this year, yes, um, we began to work on the, oh, la this year and last year, uh, Paradox began to work on console games, which was completely new to us. We are historically a computer uh, PC company. Whenever you run a study on uh, a console game, you will end up describing something that happened to the controls, uh, usually bad things. Uh, a participant tried something and it didn't work out at all. And researchers being what they are because of their training, if you let them just go at it, they will be thorough and precise. They will describe when each button was pressed, when each button was released, <laughs> what was the angle of the right stick when it was pushed, and again, it's thorough, 
but it's not very fast. And a thing about words of text is that sometimes you can still have um, room for interpretation and things not being clear. So we had situations where we send this wall of text description of something that went wrong with like yeah, the camera controls on left stick, for example, and we just heard back, which is like, what, do you mean that or that thing? Which mode of camera was being used at that time? And we do enjoy those back and forth with devs, but maybe we should start by communicating better from the start so that they don't have to write back. So I am now going to try to show you the demo real quick. I'm switching to another tab. And so the tool itself, it's a web page. I have a PS4 controller. It's a regular one connected by USB. And now I'm going to do this. And that's the end of my demo of this tool. <laughs> you get it. Uh, it sticks, it looks like this. And this very simple thing was really um, helpful for us in um, removing all of that uh, extra, you know, back and forth between devs and researchers. Um, I also want to bring an extra point, even though I'm kind of done presenting that tool, is that when we were talking about this one, we had the discussion of should this be inside the build or should this be an external thing that can be plugged on different games. Um, one side of the argument was, hey, the build is already caring about the inputs, so it should be easy enough to just add this kind of system to you know, show it at the same time that it is just doing things for the, the game engine. Um, that's true. But um, the other side of this uh, argument is um, working with, with devs can work if you already are kind of tight with them. In that case, that wasn't the case. Um, unfortunately, they were strangers to us. So, <coughs> especially because this was a publishing contract, so they were not even in the building in the same continent. So um, as a team, we didn't feel okay with our first interaction ever with, this, with those devs being like, hey guys, we need, we need engineering work. <coughs> oh, you have deadlines, but we need engineering work. We want to do something that will maybe please you after that. And even though the, the goal is nice, the order of things is all wrong. So <laughs> we decided against that, and we spent, I think, more time because it took us a while before finding a universal solution. We were lucky enough, the answer was Google Chrome and something called the Gamepad API. So you guys should know that in every browser right now that is modern, this thing is just built in, or at least the listening to Gamepad events. Uh, the, the bad thing though is that Google Chrome, the Chrome dev team was interested in this in like 2014 and then they kind of gave up. So the, the code is like three-fourths there so you have to dig around and figure out by yourself how to, to use this. The other thing on the discussion of what should get inside a build or what should be uh, a tool that every project you work on should, should, you know, should use or not is that uh, it has to do with work hours. Uh, crunch in the games industry is a very complex topic. Um, I'm guilty of I've spent months when crunching when I shouldn't have. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's out of the scope of this, of this um, talk. What I want to say is that if you are a central team of researchers, um, I really recommend that you try to stick very closely to 40 hours a week. Uh, I'm saying this because even though our devs are, can crunch, <coughs> I argue that it's easier, easier for them because they can crunch and so have a workload that is like this for a while, but then they ship something, or they HMI zone. And then everybody in that, in that group, they get to kind of, you know, recover. But with what's going on uh, at Paradox, we just move from one project to the next all the time. So this is our baseline. And any bump up, if we're being <coughs> honest, and my team is somebody, everybody in my team cares a lot about helping all of the teams that they can, they would never go down, so they would just go back to the baseline which is a bad thing where you are a knowledge worker and the value that you bring to the company is like good decisions. So, takeaways out of this. Words don't always help. Um, coming from academia, words uh, has been, you know, a useful tool, but there are specific situations where you should just like kind of let it go. And if you're in charge of a central team, 
each time that a dev wants to build something custom for their game when it comes to working with you, um, maybe try to avoid this because each tool has a maintenance cost and each tool that you agree to that is specific to this one game might bite you in the ass a few months or years down the line because maybe the, it's likely that the game build will change and suddenly your tool will be out of sync and then suddenly somebody shows up and messes with your planning because they need extra work from you guys while you might be busy with something else. Um, speaking of tools who work with every kind of project that are not you know, game build dependent, um, I want to show you the, our streaming web page. Uh, I think it's safe to assume that many user research teams that can afford it have a streaming solution. Uh, this is how it works for us. It's a web page. You, we write a bunch of information. We show two things per participant. We show you know, a video player. And the most important thing about this, we have a text field. And the text field comes from the fact that whenever we conduct a study and we stream the thing, um, for a very long time, we had at least one developer who came back with I see that this is not working out. I see that this one person is having a terrible time with my game. But is she the right person? And again, like, I welcome the, the back and forth with devs, but this way of starting a discussion is not very, it's not especially smart. It won't get us anywhere because it will be the researcher who goes through his notes, yes, and that's it. Um, so when we built the, this tool, we made sure that beneath each video player, there's a text field that we can, um, on the back end, there's another web page that all of my team can use to change the text live. So what we usually do is that at the beginning, beneath each video player, we add a very detailed description of the participant profile. This person played this for that many hours, she owns a PS4, she's into this brand or IP. And on top of that, if something goes wrong during the, the user study, like maybe this person completely lied about uh, their profile, which is rare but happens, or what if the, the build wiped you know, five hours of gameplay uh, by destroying a save? We can put that here so that, again, we prevent having like five developers who hit, hit us up on Slack to ask, hey, why is she just at act one? What's going on? And it has been extremely useful. Uh, since we just added this text field, I think that those kind of not so great discussion with this went down by 90%. And the 10 person that remain are, I think, way smarter. Because now what happens is that if they have this thing where they sit at, at their desk, watch the stream from there, and see this thing that they really, really are frustrated by, the knee-jerk reaction, which is like, oh, she's probably not the right person. They'll have it at their desk, and then they'll, they'll read the text that is beneath the video, and then they can get to think by themselves, you know, cool down a little while, and go like, might be the pro it might be the game that is at fault this time. And what's cool is that then some, some of them come back with more interesting discussion. Like, ha, huh, she keeps pressing things that way. Could she ask her if she plays game Y? And yeah, sometimes we do, and it's just those ad hoc requests that we are you know, happy to oblige, to oblige and teach also us, the user search team, something. So, things you should think about. Um, whenever there's a new tool, it's a good moment to kind of reset not so great interaction with other parts of your company. So, I don't know what that could be for you, I don't know about your work context, but whenever there's a new tool, maybe there's a way to prevent from the start things that are tedious, that you don't like doing with devs or other parts of the company. And those were the tools that I like. Uh, I also wanted to bring up a, a less positive situation right now, and that's about um, our booking schedule, um, the, my team's calendar, in other words. It looks like this. It's a sheet. Uh, you don't have to care about the details so much. It's just this is a document where my team tries to figure out who works on what when. Simple. But the situation is that we like it. It's helpful for us to, you know, 
put the resources where they need to be, and nobody else at the company gets it. Um, what they would like to do is to use that document to figure out when they can book us. But they don't, it's not instinctive to understand when they can book us. Because even though a researcher might be available next week, doesn't matter if the administrator was not available before that to find the participants. Um, so, if anybody else has solved this, I'm listening. Um, my current takeaway on this tool is this. <laughs> um, we come to a close to my talk. Uh, I want to thank you and Doral and Carlino who are over there because they used to be, paradox, uh, before they joined DICE and uh, we just want to give you a shout out because the, the good things that we are building now are built on top of good things that you guys have done at Paradox. Uh, also, a big shout out to Max Burke which was my coach for this talk and he, he was awesome. Um, yeah. Thanks to the user research team at Paradox back in Stockholm and thanks to the organizers. Um, I will go to questions in a minute. <laughs> um, I added a, I don't know if that's good decision making, but I added a slide 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and um, so here's the slide. Those are two words. They mean something to me, but they are ve it's very obscure. Very, very obscure reference. But I was standing uh, during the breakfast portion of the day and I thought it difficult to kind of go to strangers and talk to them. So if somebody, if anybody feels like talking to me, uh, yeah, come up to me and ask me what, what's up with those words. So that way we can get, we can get uh, a discussion going. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I need to do this. Yes, I'm good. <laughs> Hi there, uh, that was a fantastic talk, thank you for that. Thanks. Over here, over here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I, I'm really impressed by the fact that you showed us the, basically the accountability systems you use in your own company, basically. Uh, the Excel spreadsheet, I'm talking about the Excel spreadsheet, because it's a system that basically helps all the team account for their progress, where they stand, et cetera, et cetera. And I think these are the systems that user researchers, like all of us, I guess here, are really interested into when it comes to developing, designing actually, developing insight and designing a new application. So the problem with be bespoke systems like that is usually that it takes a lot of time to get used to them, to accustom someone, someone yep. with them. And I guess that might create problems with new recruits. And my question is whether you had this problem before, whether that creates an overhead in the recruitment process and for the new guys to get used to being part of the company, basically, and of, of the culture of the company. That's interesting. <laughs> um, so far it's okay because, um, and it's kind of an unsaid rule, but right now when you join our team, um, you're not expected to become this user researcher plus coder person. What we do is that we hire people from, that are all weird and different from each other, and some of them bring that. So right now what's going on is that uh, I can do JavaScript, Henrik can do Python, and we have a, a third researcher who is not that uh, knowledgeable yet, but the plan is for us to give him like two hours a week to get started, and he will know that while he learns programming, which will take years, I think. Uh, he will have two other people in his team to just kind of like watch over him, kind of. Um, then I'm also thinking about recruiting, but I don't know if that's also something you were thinking about. About uh, hiring new people, uh, yeah. the, the way we select them. Is that also something that... Okay, all right. <coughs> Any more questions? Hi, hey. great talk. So, Thank um, you. Um, at the start of the uh, slides, you showed the observations and you record. Oh, sorry, over here. Uh, yes, let's start with you. <laughs> sorry. My apologies. <laughs> um, at the start, those observations and times for when uh, certain things were recording, you were recording when a user account had an issue. Um, in the prior talk, uh, the gentleman was talking about combining different types of. Uh, uh, for research together, so in this case, uh, both uh, play sessions. I was wondering, do you use uh, telemetry like uh, data tracking to also see when the user is are hitting those observations and issues? Very good question. Um, we've been around for two years, and the, the, the company is a bit 
new to UX as a whole. So right now we have discussions. Like, should, you know, should this strategy game uh, export the state of each resource every tick or every X frames or seconds? But right now, the less, um, just ob direct observation and talking with people get us far enough. I realize how much we're living on the table, we're living a lot. But so far, the, the best way we can help people ship games is to kind of keep this out of the way for now. And I think that, you know, give us a year or two, let us grow, and both the, the, both the devs and us will be able to get somewhere, like the state you described. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, uh, if I understood well, so you you're have, have a really busy schedule, uh, but you're also building tools. So how do you manage to do both things at the same when time? When things get cancelled. Not games, just one study. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's one part of the, of the thing. Uh, right now we're also trying to add, a, you get just, if you're an employee, you get two hours of like, self-development. And that would be like per week. And that would be like the right time because then employees can just by themselves decide, I want to build the tool and they would be motivated and they would do that. Um, the less glamorous side of this is that, again, we're two years old, which means that during some of our early months, things weren't that busy. Oh, there's a new team on publishing. What are they? I don't know. Have, have we been shipping successful games for many years? Yes. So for a while, people, some parts of the, of the company were not working with us. So that's where we went you know, crazy on the tool side. I, it's always difficult to tell how long a piece of string is for me, and so I was interested to see that you could predict um, how far you were yeah. from completion by how many of these kind of coding measures you'd completed, because, mm -hmm. I mean, I find maybe it's the kind of problem you work on, but the, the heavy lifting is like after you've done that, typically. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's yeah. the bit that can get really kind of like, oh, did the team understand that? No, another infographic, oh shit, you know. <laughs> kind of like. For sure. Do, do, you, do you find it's actually a good, I mean, is the bulk of the work around the coding and then the other stuff is generally kind of transparent after that? Does it fall out for you? Or? No, I think that the problem you describe is real. I think that the, the one thing that cannot be compressed is the, when the lead researcher mm -hmm looks at the, everybody, what everybody has analyzed and kind of has to explain now. You know, now, mm -hmm. now is the time to make a slide desk, uh, mm -hmm. slide, slides deck, or a report or a presentation. Mm -hmm. But what's, again, this is like, you know, deep work. And you get to a better, like, headspace when you have to start this, you know, heavy, deep work. Mm -hmm. When all of the days leading up to that, you kind of knew, oh, I'm 60% in, I'm 70% in. Mm -hmm. So it's just about lowering the stress level. Yeah. Leading up to the... the, the so you could do the road foundation, you've got all the digging done and all yep. the gravel and <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> Cheers, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Jean-Luc. Yep.